Book Two, Chapter Seventeen of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. One night. Never did the sun go down with a brighter glory on the quiet corner in Soho than one memorable evening when the doctor and his daughter sat under the plane tree together. Never did the moon rise with a milder radiance over great London than on that night when it found them still seated under the tree and shone upon their faces through its leaves. Lucy was to be married to-morrow. She had reserved this last evening for her father and they sat alone under the plane tree. You are happy, my dear father? Quite, my child. They had said little, though they had been there a long time. When it was yet light enough to work and read, she had neither engaged herself in her usual work, nor had she read to him. She had employed herself in both ways, at his side under the tree, many and many a time. But this time was not quite like any other. And nothing could make it so. And I am very happy tonight, dear father. I am deeply happy in the love that heaven has so blessed, my love for Charles and Charles's love for me. But if my life were not to be still consecrated to you, or if my marriage were so arranged as that it would part us, even by the length of a few of these streets, I should be more unhappy and self-reproachful now than I can tell you, even as it is. Even as it was, she could not command her voice. In the sad moonlight, she clasped him by the neck and laid her face upon his breast. In the moonlight, which is always sad, as the light of the sun itself is, as the light called human life is, at its coming and going. Dearest dear, can you tell me this last time that you feel quite, quite sure no new affections of mine and no new duties of mine will ever interpose between us? I know it well, but do you know it? In your own heart, do you feel quite certain? Her father answered with a cheerful firmness of conviction he could scarcely have assumed. Quite sure, my darling. More than that, he added, as he tenderly kissed her. My future is far brighter, Lucy, seen through your marriage, than it could have been, nay, than it ever was, without it. If I could hope that, my father. Believe it, love. Indeed it is so. Consider how natural and how plain it is, my dear, that it should be so. You, devoted and young, cannot fully appreciate the anxiety I have felt that your life should not be wasted. She moved her hand toward his lips, but he took it in his and repeated the word. Wasted, my child, should not be wasted, struck aside from the natural order of things for my sake. Your unselfishness cannot entirely comprehend how much my mind has gone on this. But only ask yourself, how could my happiness be perfect while yours was incomplete? If I had never seen Charles, my father, I should have been quite happy with you. He smiled at her unconscious admission that she would have been unhappy without Charles having seen him, and replied, My child, you did see him, and it is Charles. If it had not been Charles, it would have been another. Or if it had been no other, I should have been the cause. And then the dark part of my life would have cast its shadow beyond myself and would have fallen on you. It was the first time, except at the trial, of her ever hearing him refer to the period of his suffering. It gave her a strange and new sensation while his words were in her ears, and she remembered it long afterwards. See, said the doctor of Beauvais, raising his hand towards the moon. I have looked at her from my prison window when I could not bear her light. I have looked at her when it has been such torture to me to think of her shining upon what I had lost, that I have beaten my head against my prison walls. I have looked at her in a state so dull and lethargic that I have thought of nothing but the number of horizontal lines I could draw across her at the full and the number of perpendicular lines with which I could intersect them. He added in his inward and pondering manner, as he looked at the moon, It was twenty either way, I remember, and the twentieth was difficult to squeeze in. The strange thrill with which she heard him go back to that time deepened as he dwelt upon it, but there was nothing to shock her in the manner of his reference. 
he only seemed to contrast his present cheerfulness and felicity with the dire endurance that was over. I have looked at her, speculating thousands of times upon the unborn child from whom I had been rent. Whether it was alive, whether it had been born alive, or the poor mother's shock had killed it, whether it was a son who would some day avenge his father. There was a time in my imprisonment when my desire for vengeance was unbearable, whether it was a son who would never know his father's story, who might even live to weigh the possibility of his father's having disappeared of his own will and act, whether it was a daughter who would grow to be a woman. She drew closer to him and kissed his cheek and hand. I have pictured my daughter to myself as perfectly forgetful of me, rather altogether ignorant of me and unconscious of me. I have cast up the years of her age, year after year. I have seen her married to a man who knew nothing of my fate. I have altogether perished from the remembrance of the living, and in the next generation my place was a blank. My father, even to hear that you had such thoughts of a daughter who never existed, strikes to my heart as if I had been that child. You, Lucy, it is out of the consolation and restoration you have brought to me that these remembrances arise, and pass between us and the moon on this last night. What did I just say now? She knew nothing of you. She cared nothing for you. So, but on other moonlight nights, when the sadness and the silence have touched me in a different way, have affected me with something like a sorrowful sense of peace, as any emotion that had pain for its foundations could, I have imagined her as coming to me in my cell and leading me out into the freedom beyond the fortress. I have seen her image in the moonlight often, as I now see you, except that I never held her in my arms. It stood between the little grated window and the door. But you understand that that was not the child I am speaking of? The figure was not... The, the image, the fancy? No, that was another thing. It stood before my disturbed sense of sight, but it never moved. The phantom that my mind pursued was another and more real child. Of her outward appearance, I know no more than that she was like her mother. The other had that likeness too, as you have, but it was not the same. Can you follow me, Lucy? Hardly, I think. I doubt you must have been a solitary prisoner to understand these perplexed distinctions. His collected and calm manner could not prevent her blood from running cold as he thus tried to anatomize his old condition. In that more peaceful state, I have imagined her in the moonlight, coming to me and taking me out to show me that the home of her married life was full of her loving remembrance of her lost father. My picture was in her room, and I was in her prayers. Her life was active, cheerful, useful. But my poor history pervaded it all. I was that child, my father. I was not half so good, but in my love, that was I. And she showed me her children, said the doctor of Beauvais. And they had heard of me, and had been taught to pity me. When they passed a the prison of the state, they kept far from its frowning walls and looked up at its bars and spoke in whispers. She could never deliver me. I imagined that she always brought me back after showing me such things. But then, blessed with the relief of tears, I fell upon my knees and blessed her. I am that child, I hope, my father. Oh, my dear, my dear, will you bless me as fervently tomorrow? Lucy, I recall these old troubles in the reason that I have tonight for loving you better than words can tell and thanking God for my great happiness. My thoughts, when they were wildest, never rose near the happiness that I have known with you and that we have before us. He embraced her, solemnly commended her to heaven, and humbly thanked heaven for having bestowed her on him. By and by, they went into the house. There was no one bidden to the marriage but Mr. Lorry. There was even to be no bridesmaid but the gaunt Miss Pross. The marriage was to make no change in their place of residence. 
they had been able to extend it by taking to themselves the upper rooms formerly belonging to the apocryphal invisible lodger, and they desired nothing more. Dr. Manette was very cheerful at the little supper. They were only three at table, and Miss Pross made the third. He regretted that Charles was not there, was more than half disposed to object to the loving little plot that kept him away, and drank to him affectionately. So the time came for him to bid Lucy good night, and they separated. But in the stillness of the third hour of the morning, Lucy came downstairs again and stole into his room, not free from unshaped fears beforehand. All things, however, were in their places. All was quiet, and he lay asleep, his white hair picturesque on the untroubled pillow, and his hands lying quiet on the coverlet. She put her needless candle in the shadow at a distance, crept up to his bed, and put her lips to his, then leaned over him and looked at him. Into his handsome face the bitter waters of captivity had worn but he covered up their tracks with a determination so strong that he held the mastery of them even in his sleep. A more remarkable face in its quiet, resolute, and guarded struggle with an unseen assailant was not to be beheld in all the wide dominions of sleep that night. She timidly laid her hand on his dear breast and put up a prayer that she might ever be as true to him as her love aspired to be, and as his sorrows deserved. Then she withdrew her hand and kissed his lips once more and went away. So the sunrise came and the shadows of the leaves of the plane tree moved upon his face as softly as her lips had moved in praying for him. End of chapter.